So let's uh, start our reflection with a prayer. <clears throat> our loving Father, lead us into the depth, the width, and the height of your love through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I neglected to introduce Pastor That's okay. Leanna. And I probably don't but need to. No need. She's, she's been with <laughs> us for five, six years now as a member of our congregation. But she was also ordained here about a year and a half ago through LCMC. And interestingly, Pastor Amy was a part of the interview committee that helped certify Pastor Leanna. So they, they've, they've been friends for some time now. Pastor Leanna was raised in Latvia and became a Christian about age 11 or 12 when a Lutheran pastor came to their village. And her mom's been holding church in their home ever since, umpteen years ago. So she has a wonderful, wonderful story. She's a full-time chaplain at Good Samaritan Exempla Hospital <clears throat> in Lafayette. So thank you, Leanna, for You're sharing welcome. the message with us today. You're welcome. <clears throat> well, God has given us a very powerful text written in a form of a letter. And I have a question for you. You know that I like to ask questions <laughs> to you. So when you write a letter, what do you think about the person. Very good. Yes. So how it will be received and how it will be interpreted. And it's a dialogue with the recipient. And Paul just finished the previous chapter explaining God's work of justification. His last words are, where sin increases, grace increases all the more. And now he's thinking, I wonder how they will take that. He knows that the response could be, let's sin more so that grace may increase. And Paul's response is, no, no, no. By no means, you have to understand that something absolutely marvelous and glorious has happened to you. The Father has united you with Christ. And more precise uh, translation in Greek is, the Father has grafted you on Christ in a separable way. And what does this imply? Our old nature, the nature who was enslaved to sin, against God, and headed towards destruction, is crucified with Christ. It has been buried with Christ through baptism. Paul wants us to understand that this is the finished work of God. The old nature is done away with by Christ. And not only that, we are raised up to newness of life just as Christ was raised from the dead. The scriptures refer to this as being born again. Or if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Good. What is all has passed away. And by what means was Christ raised from the dead? It's a question to you. By what means was he raised from the dead? Don't be shy. Say again. Yes, by what means? How was he raised from the dead? Yes. The power of the Holy Spirit. That's correct. He was raised through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the same is true in our lives. The Holy Spirit has given to us a new heart and is leading us in the newness of life. The Father in his wisdom has covered it all. Christ to deal with our sin and the Holy Spirit to form the new person. We are never alone or doing this work by ourselves. And I want you to take a look at the cross here uh, we have in our sanctuary. When you look at the cross, what do you think about? What do you think about when you look at the cross? Why is the cross here? Okay, crucifixion. How about you? Good. Okay. That's correct. And, um, but the cross tells us two stories. 
the cross tells us the story of what Christ did for us out of love. But it also tells the story of us that cross is also about us. That our old self has been crucified. Our sin has been dealt away with. If Christ is no longer on the cross, neither are we. We are alive to God. Praise be to God. Let's say together, praise Praise be be to God. God. And now, how do we walk in this newness of life? I think to walk in the newness of life, we have to have a closure with our past. As a chaplain, I see how incredibly important any closure is. It could be a closure regarding someone's death or any other change in life. If we don't have a closure, we struggle to heal and we struggle to pursue the future. And I believe the same is true for our spiritual lives. It is an absolute must to have a closure with our past. We are not allowed to dig up our old corpse because God is not either. If we think that we are maybe saved and our old nature is sort of dead and the Holy Spirit only visits us occasionally, we got a huge problem because we will never ever will be able to respond to God wholeheartedly. We have to embrace everything that God has done for us to to be able to give everything about us to God. Partial acceptance leads to partial giving. So let's accept fully what he has done for us. And I want to mention two examples. Working in hospital, I work with many people who are close to dying. And there was this elderly woman who was dying. And she was struggling with many doubts. And she was saying, I hope God has forgiven me. And my response was, honey, we don't have to hope. We know he has. And also the example of, uh, of Mary who was crying on Jesus' feet and wiping with her hair uh, his feet. You know, many struggle, many disciples struggle to see that scene. But what, uh, what was Jesus' response? He said, I tell you then, that the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. Jesus is saying that she, that she was able to respond to him in such a way because she had received the gift of forgiveness fully. That's where her mad and generous love came out of that heart of forgiveness and acceptance of that forgiveness. And my suggestion is, if you doubt your salvation, just start thanking God for it. If you wrestle with your old nature, Just start thanking the Holy Spirit of working on your new nature and become a partner with the Holy Spirit. If you doubt that you are not loved and accepted by God, be diligent in starting out your day thanking God for his love for you. Also, to walk in the newness of life, it's important to know and grow in our true identity. Do you know what is the percentage of prisoners who have been set free but are returning to the prison in a short a period of time? What is the percentage of prisoners returning to a prison? I hear 60. Yeah, well, good, it's close. <laughs> So statistics show that about 70 to 80 percent of prisoners who have been released from the prison return to it within three years. That's a big number. And why is it so? I believe that they, they return because they don't have any clue about their new identity and the way of new life or how it can be lived or who they are when they leave the, uh, the prison. 
they revert back to old and familiar habits. And Christ has set us free from a prisoner of sin. And Paul puts it in this way. We are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves of righteousness. To be able to walk successfully in newness of life, we have to know what our true identity in Christ is and where we are heading. It's absolutely essential to become this new creation. I believe that so many of our sinful habits are symptoms of our unclaimed and unlived identity. We fall in all kinds of hurtful behavior towards each other and the self because we are profoundly insecure. As a chaplain, I hear many confessions all the time. And as I listen to people, I love to encourage them to go deeper than the behavior struggle. And sometimes I would ask them, what are you not believing about yourself that leads you in this behavior? What kind of image of God contribu contributes to your struggle? Many times we repent from our behavior, but we fail to tackle the root causes. And the root causes many times are in our identity. I believe that the deeper sin is this belief in our true identity and who God is for us. And as I was praying for this text today, the image of a bird cage came to me. So that was a bird cage, but the cage door was open. But all the birds were still sitting inside. And they were making mess, as birds do, so you know what I mean by that. <laughs> and as, as I was trying to reflect deeper on this image, it was like God was saying to me, My people ask me for forgiveness for making a mess in that cage when I am more concerned about them not leaving the cage. The Lord wants us to fly, but it takes an understanding of this new freedom to leave the cage, doesn't it? I love a quote by Graham Cook. We do not become new persons by changing behavior. We discover who we are and behave accordingly. I counted about 98 references to our new identity in Christ in the New Testament. That's impressive, isn't it? And there are probably more. God's beloved people study them, rejoice in them, live in them. Your focus will always determine your path. Be confident in who you are in him. I love that fact that we can be absolutely confident and humble at the same time. It not, it's not dangerous for us to be confident in Christ because everything is his gift, isn't it? We don't have to boast about anything. We can be absolutely confident and humble at the same time. And no life circumstances can alternate who we are in Christ. Everything can change, but that will never change who we are in him. And um, to walk in a newness of life, we also have to partner with the Holy Spirit. I love the reality of Christian life. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. That's correct. It's amazing, isn't it? It's covered from all around. <laughs> Being in Christ is about our standing before the Father. Our state in life always changes. It's up and down, up and down. But our standing is rock solid. It never changes. The Father has placed us in the safest place possible, which is Jesus. And Romans 8, 1 says, 
There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Very good. There is no shame. There is no punishment. There is no accusation. He has placed us in the safest place so we can grow, develop without any fears. And if you feel accusation in your heart or for somebody else, no, it's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit always encourages us in our new freedom. And being in Christ is a place of ongoing favor from the Father, released to us as He and He relates to us as He relates to Jesus. I love the passage in Second Corinthians two fifteen. For we are a sweet aroma of Christ to the Father. That's pretty nice, isn't it? <laughs> so tell, show me, how do you smell a flower? How do you smell? Ah, don't we? It's absolute delight, isn't it? And next time you do that, remember that that's how the Father feels about you. He feels about you with the same beautiful delight. He is so attracted to Christ in you. And not only that, he gives to us everything he gives to his son. And that's why the scriptures say, we are co-heirs with Christ. Our position before the Father in Christ is wonderfully glorious. So if um, being in Christ is about our standing before the Father, then Christ in us is about being empowered by the Holy Spirit from inside. When God gives us a new heart, the Holy Spirit makes a habitation in it. And I will share you a quick Christmas story that happened to me when I first became a believer. I was in prayer time, and it was like God was asking me. He says, do you know how you are and other believers like the Virgin Mary, how you are alike. And I was sitting there and pondering. And then the answer came. Like Mary was pregnant with Jesus, so you are pregnant with the Holy Spirit. All my believers are. And for men in this congregation, it's the only chance for you to be ever pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, if you ask a mother who is carrying a baby inside of her, you know how attentive they are to that baby, to that new life in them, to the other in them. And that is the same attentiveness we are invited to. We have to be attentive to the indwelling spirit in the same way, the spirit who lives in us. I want you to just place your hand upon your heart. And for a moment, um, in a silence, to recognize the life of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Let's say it together. Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's pretty amazing, isn't it, that he lives inside of us. And Paul is saying, now you have to treat him as your new master. Because the sin was mastering over you and you were enslaved to sin, but now the Holy Spirit is your master. Treat him like that. And I want to speak briefly about the work of this new master and what he's trying to do in us. The Holy Spirit is not fixing up our old nature because it is dead. But he is growing us up in our new identity in Christ. How many of you like to create something? Many people. And how do you feel when you are about to start to do something, to create something? How do you say again? Excited. Excited. Yeah, that's, that's, and that's, um, and that is the way the Holy Spirit feels about us. He's so excited that he gets to create us, to form us. He is unconditionally committed to his job in our new nature. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship. And a more precise translation in Greek is, 
his masterpiece or poem. And there is another quote I love by Graham Cook that describes the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Father looks at us, he does not see what is wrong with us, but what is missing from our fullness in Christ. And he is absolutely committed to giving that to us. When the Holy Spirit points to something that's not working in your life, he is pointing to the site of next miracle. So try to look through that perspective with anything you struggle in your life, that it truly can be the site of the next miracle. The Holy Spirit sees where we are not living up to our identity and is constantly calling us upward to that new identity. It might sound strange, but even when I fall, I feel the enthusiasm and excitement of the Holy Spirit. It is like he is saying, Liana, remember who you are in Christ. Get up. Let's keep walking. Not long ago, I wrote in my journal, even in my falling, I feel God's excitement of my becoming. Even in my falling, I feel God's excitement of my becoming. God's discipline is always steeped in his vision of our full potential. When we are convinced of something wrong, we can respond in two ways. We can become very discouraged with ourselves, or we can be utterly grateful and join the Holy Spirit in making any changes. And we might be concerned about the present situation in our church, but guess what? The Holy Spirit is absolutely excited. Because he gets to do what he loves to do, he loves to shape, he loves to form, he loves to change and inspire. He loves doing all of it. And I was observing our worship team, not only today, but also previously. And I can see the excitement of the Holy Spirit in those people. With a new enthusiasm, they are approaching this. And my invitation is that you all join his excitement of creating something new. And you examine yourself and see maybe how you can partner with him in this new season of fall to do anything in this church. So, to truly walk in a newness of life, we have to partner with the Holy Spirit, which means being always aware of his presence within us, listening to him, yielding to him, taking risks with him, using his gifts and sharing the fruit he produces with other people in this world. And above all, we are called to be on the same page the Holy Spirit is on. And I think when two people come together, two persons, to create anything in life, to have a project, you have to talk and decide where we are going, don't you? You have to agree. And I think uh, we are, the Holy Spirit knows what our identity is in Christ, and he knows what he wants to build. And we have to agree with that to work well, to partner well. And that's where our invitation is. And now I will be leading you in a prayer of thanksgiving for our identity. And I just want you to open your heart and to receive the identity that is proclaimed in the scriptures about you and to give thanks to God and to dedicate your life to step into those places of new identity. Our loving Father, we thank you that our standing in Christ is absolutely glorious and astonishing. We are so humbled and grateful. We thank you that we are loved, delighted in, 
delivered from the power of darkness, forgiven for all times, washed clean, anointed, completely whole in Christ, and alive to you. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places, and we are co-heirs of your glorious riches. Thank you that we are the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit and his masterpiece created in the image of Christ with such enthusiasm and delight. Lord, it is you who calls us your friends and saints, the light and the salt of this world, vessels of your glory and the apple of your eye. And what an honor to be called the bride of Christ. We are allured, pursued, cherished, desired, and joined with Christ. Thank you, Father, for finding joy in working with us and calling us your co-laborers. Thank you that we are ambassadors of Christ and the sweet aroma of your Son wherever we go. Thank you that we are your possession, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and so much more. Father, help us to cherish and embrace the fullness of our identity. We know you want us to fly, to be cageless birds who know there are new horizons awaiting for us. Amen.